the reason I decided to get involved in direct action, because I realized, I suppose, in my 30s, that this is a war. And actually, the the system, the establishment, is doing everything it possibly can to shut people out uh, of having a, a home of their own. I mean, I'm in Stroud at the moment, and uh, here there are lots of little um, holes in the in the commons, right, where people have dug over in history um, to, bit, to to dig up stones to build their own cottages around here, and you can see these pits everywhere. Uh, even actually out in the woods uh, or towards Sirencester and places like that. You know, just a hole in the ground where people have spent a few days digging into the ground, just getting stones to build a cottage. Now, back in those days, we're talking really here about the sort of 1500s, 1600s, even into the 1700s, people would get those, they would buy a piece of land. So, you know, that was relatively cheap. There was no such thing as planning permission. And once they saved up to buy that land, they would then build themselves a cottage on it. Now, that might be with the permission of a lord of the manor. It might be with someone else's permit. It might just be their own pro private property. But the fact was that people did things like that. Now, I have a few connections with New Zealand, and I can tell you over there, people do not buy, generally buy, off-the-shelf properties from some big developer. They buy a little piece of land, some of it very cheap, uh, in what they call uh, the wop wops, which is basically these dirt roads running into the jungle, and uh, they just build their own place, and that's just the norm. Whereas in the UK, what's happened is the war has left us in a situation where we cannot do that. It's just impossible. And if you try and get planning permission, you're blocked all the way. So that's where we are. You know, we're like kind of rats in a in a in a maze, you know, trying to do the basic thing, which is to get somewhere to live, uh, which everybody needs, you know. Uh, anyway, so that's why I got involved in direct action. Uh, I mean, I was in Oxford at the time um, and got friendly with George Monbiot. This is back in 1995, 96. Uh, he was trying to get himself a guardian column and largely on the back of our land rights actions, he was, you know, he got a lot of credibility there and he got his column. and. And what we did was we we identified sites from campaigners around the country, mostly in the south, because most of our people and supporters were in the south, and we just occupied them. Uh, you know, we were basically sticking two fingers up at the land developer, whoever it was that owned the land. A lot of the time, of course, these pieces of property, slices of land, were just sitting there like money in uh, in the bank because they. You know, the speculators buy prop buy property, buy whatever, 14, 15 acres, whatever was on it, they demolish it. And then they just leave it for a decade or something as it accumulates value, uh, what they call land banking. And when we did our, for example, I'll run through, I can run through some of the actions that we did. But, uh, the, for example, when we were in Wandsworth, we took over a big piece of land next to Wandsworth Bridge, uh, which uh, there was a lovely guy called Kirk who lived in one of the local tower blocks who'd been campaigning against this supermarket that they were going to build on there. And it was just one guy. It was almost like a David and Goliath struggle. But we we saw this and we thought, this is great. Let's just go in and get, get behind him, you know. And so we brought uh, three or four coach loads of people on a magical mystery tour, all ending up synchronised. The coach is synchronised to arrive at the gate just after the uh, place had been opened up by another crew. Uh, and uh, something like 300 people piled in. And we took took over the place for, as it ended up, six months. But uh, I can always remember being down there when a policeman came past. And he walked in and he said, uh, he said, I drive past this place every day on my way to work and on my way home. And every time I go past it, I look at it and I think, what a criminal waste. And of course it is. And that's because capitalism is basically in a kind of manic terminal phase where uh, you know, the, the 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 people with the money have got so much power that they can just buy up various of our, you know, infrastructure, that is to say big pieces of land, and use it for their own personal speculation, land property speculation, uh, like the casino. And so we, are, we as people are being increasingly shut out of, you know, I don't think personally that anybody should have to pay a penny for the land that they live on, whether it's through rent or anything else. And, uh, you know, this, as, as many people have said, uh, the earth is a free gift to mankind. Uh, what are we doing paying somebody else just to be? Mm -hmm. So there's my sort of, in a nutshell, um, 
of why I do why I do and did what I do. So, uh, you know, I think that the war requires the steely mentality to go and do direct action, to go and squat a piece of land, take it over, occupy it, and say, actually, you know, as we used to say, the land is ours. So, and and get the, the message out to people that you know we we can and we should. Um, uh, do this sort of thing because it's simply not acceptable for i mean you know what's happening now as you just touched on yourself uh people having rent increases at a time when fuel prices are going up basically we're caught in a financial trap in a financial cage and people are just had enough of it so uh yeah once we can get uh this wonderful land back one of the figures i quote quite a lot is 60 million acres in britain and 60 million people so where's my acre you know, this is basic, basic stuff that we have been shut out by the establishment and the establishment mainly, I would say, is the city. You know, so we're not necessarily talking about the feudal system, because I think a lot of the uh, feudal dukes, etc., some of them are actually quite decent people. And they, you know, allow people to walk on them, particularly around here where I'm in Gloucestershire today. Uh, they allow people to walk on their land with no problem at all. You know, it's a great access for example to the Bathurst estates around here they just say well you know just be careful and after twilight we would rather you didn't but there's no restrictions from them so the problem really is the merchant classes not I think the feudal classes at least that's my experience and and a lot of this goes back to the English Civil War uh, which was the as everyone knows about enclosure, the privatisation of land, the English Civil War was a massive, massive acceleration to that process of enclosure, uh, which was a privatisation of the land underneath our feet. And uh, it was the first country in the world to go for mass urbanisation uh, through the Industrial Revolution, uh, Britain was, England was specifically, uh, and the Civil War speed, speeded that forward because it enabled the powerful wealthy merchant classes to get a grip on the land to start elbowing out the feudal classes and to say well actually this is just a factory floor we've got here so i think the civil war is very important to understand the history of that and uh, actually the justice of charles the first's cause against cromwell a lot of people for example the stop the war people i noticed the other day are big fans of oliver cromwell well hang on a minute you know this guy was a military dictator and in fact he was so bad that the whole country decided 10 years after the civil war to bring the king back because he'd been so awful as a military dictator running britain uh, so and also of course it's all the stuff he did in ireland so i think it's really important to understand the you know the civil war uh, was uh, a key in the acceleration of all this. This led to uh, the Industrial Revolution, as I said, and effectively led to the British Empire because the people were kicked off the land in enclosures and they were forced to work in factories, producing you know, all the equipment that Britain needed uh, to uh, expand and uh, you know, set, set sail around the world to govern places, to take over places with this massive pool of of basically indentured labour, people that had no access to food except through, uh, uh, they couldn't grow their own anymore, uh, to, except through um, working in one of these dark satanic mills. So that's it, I suppose, in a nutshell. As it comes to the, the Land land is Ours campaign, um, we focused on a lot on the history. And I think it's important to do that, to remind people of their history, because this is basically censored. Uh, it was certainly up until the Second World War, censored history, what happened in the Civil War with the diggers and the levellers, and, the, and there were other groups too, but mainly them. And uh, they were absolutely right in fixing on land, particularly the diggers who called themselves the true levellers, were focused on land as the main problem. You know, So they set up shop on St George's Hill, in Surrey, which is now a private Beverly Hills gated estate in Surrey. And they they uh, uh, basically did what we did when we were occupying. They just took a, they put up some houses. They started to grow crops on the commons. Now, you know, that that uh, it's almost a, a massive irony that it's now a private gated estate. But back in 1999, we got our act together to, first of all, to set up a public meeting on there. And then with all the people that had come, we invited them to come and stay on the hill. So we had already 
got a load of equipment in there, some, uh, uh, well, well, loads of marquees, uh, basically a mobile kitchen. It was like a mobile village, really. Uh, and we set up shop with a lot of tents, people in tents, but there were also, you know, places where people could sleep uh, and we would make sure they were well fed. Uh, and uh, that was, that lasted for about two weeks. And we got some terrific news coverage, actually. And I don't know if you would today, but we certainly did back in 1999 on the Mm. London TV channels, uh, ITV and uh, BBC. So, you know, a lot of this is is political theatre. But it's also reminding people about history. And it was Christopher Hill that wrote uh, The World Turned Upside Down after World War II that started to bring some of these uh, these groups, uh, the diggers, etc., out to the public eye. And I remember um, when we were down in there in 99, which was the 350th anniversary of the diggers. Uh, so we, you know, we called it Diggers 350, and there's still an email list that I run called Diggers 350, which was started uh, for that uh, occupation. Um, and if people let me know if you want to join up with that, um, it, it's the the whole point really was to reiterate really because it started to die off what Christopher Hill did after World War Two, which was to to stress the massive massive impact that uh, the uh, diggers and the Civil War had, or the I suppose they were doing kind of what we did, really, which was to say, well, look, we're very much aware of this issue. We can't do much, but we'll, at least we can do something. We're not going to be, uh, you know, sort of depressed or whatever about it, apathetic. We're going to go and do something. And, and one of the things I'd say to uh, your viewers here, or the viewers here, people watching, is you must find others who are of a similar mind. You really must, because it's no... You can't fight these sorts of things on your own. We couldn't do it on our own. None of us could have done that on our own. We ended up with uh, between three and four hundred people coming to our on our march up to St George's Hill from Weybridge, um, and uh, it was a terrific march. And then uh, something like two hundred of those people staying on site, or maybe one hundred and fifty staying on site, uh, actually up on the hill. Uh, until we were evicted in the High Court, which was a whole episode in itself. You know, a couple of people went down to represent us in the High Court uh, and came back with all the uh, paperwork, which I've still got, actually. Uh, But anyway, the point is, as I'm sure you want to know, how do we get it back? I think, you know, you can use your imagination to think of political theatre. Bad landowners, go and find them, do something on their land, even if it's just a handful of people, you know, and make sure you inform the local news people. Uh, because I think many, many, many journalists understand this. I'm pers- myself, I'm a journalist. I was uh, working for the BBC in the early 1990s, late 80s, as a reporter in London and other local radio stations. And the, it, you know, the impact of th- little things like this, you'll find, you know, you, you'll find that there. I mean, for example, when we did our action uh, last summer and in, in August over in Brancaster, we got some very good coverage. Um, You know, that was the first thing the land is ours has done um, for something like uh, 15 years, because we hadn't really done anything much since uh, uh, about 2003, 2004. Uh, And so we've got stuff, we've got equipment, we can come and do things, uh, you know, but, you know, the ideas are find a bad landowner, do something on their land. And then what happens is people come out of the woodwork. You find all sorts of interesting characters will come along. Yeah, I think what you're doing is brilliant, even if they just come along for a day. I always remember one of the things we did was the same year in 1999, uh, we, we took over a derelict mental hospital in Norwich, uh, which was a wonderful old mental hospital. that Every single window pane had been smashed quite obviously to order someone had been paid to do it and um it was just a brilliant place that was being sold off for housing developers and uh, we got over the space of a couple of weeks we were there uh, a whole load of of um, people who had been to the mental hospital over the years coming to say hello you know oh this place was brilliant for me it helped me through a very difficult time blah blah and so by doing things by getting in the press you know you can make a difference like that it's political theater and you know just having some sort of token of resistance is very important i think so so that's why i mentioned this is because you have to have that sort of mentality where you are prepared to go onto somebody else's land i mean i for a long time was squatting in bristol and 
it's funny when you're actually squatting you're not paying rent you're in a, in somebody's house uh which is they're not using or they haven't used for a long time we were in a housing association place mostly i mean i, I went to four or five different squats there but you get this amazing feeling of liberation where you know i can't be anywhere really is that is that what you're trying to tell me when when you're squatting you feel like well actually no i can be everywhere everywhere is mine and and it's a tremendously liberating feeling so uh on to what do we do to get it back right because this is the key thing and actually what i've been talking about is is all about the right mentality to do that uh i think you know it's it's the at the heart and the core of all social injustice the land rights you know this idea of private ownership of land of land which is you know tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of acres we're seeing things getting even worse now with industrial agriculture and big multinationals investing in land so it used to be the big landowners companies and individuals and now it's things like hedge funds and they are increasingly buying into buying land and you know what they're backing as i was seeing in wales the other week these uh, hedge funds investment funds are backing companies which are buying land to offset carbon right so as this whole thing about zero carbon has come along so the hedge funds are, are using it as an excuse to get control and ownership of more and more land and they can pay for the land more than local farmers can pay so that land is, is coming out of the ownership of local farmers and into the uh, into the um, lap of the hedge funds so this is this is an enormously pernicious thing which uh, I, I did circulate that report from wales on the diggers list last week so you know we have got to be aware that all of this zero carbon stuff might just simply be a trojan horse at least it's being you know i'm not saying it's not a good idea i'm saying it's been immediately picked up by the big multinationals and our enemy which is these enormous capitalist slush funds uh to take land away from ordinary people we've also got an enormous amount of land in the in the hands of people who do own their own homes and what is happening is both labor and conservative are plotting together to make it difficult for people to pass homes on to their kids now if that happens that's well it is happening as we know you know you've got to sell the house in order to pay for the elderly care fees blah blah and labor actually wants to have a tax on uh, homes which means that if your parents wanted to hand on the home to you and they die then uh what's happening is there is a tax on that house which means that if you can't pay that tax which may be 20 30 grand who knows you have to sell the house so this is really really pernicious and it's just a way of taking away the stuff that people have worked for years and years for their families and handing it over to the multinationals and who is it that announced last year they want to be the biggest homeowner in britain hsbc has decided that they can have by i think it's uh 2027 they want to be the biggest owner of houses in the country so uh you know we're up against a massive massive like juggernaut really and i think the only way to to do it is to uh, you know to actually get access to land is to buy it really i mean pretty simple uh and this is what i just talk about some examples very successful examples of where people have done this uh one is tinker's bubble down in uh somerset which i still visit quite regularly um and that is uh i think it's 40 acres cost about fifty thousand pounds at the time and innocently bought um but quite quickly people started putting up um first benders and then a roundhouse <clears throat> and then canvas buildings and um now they got met they fought over many years to get their planning permission and i think this is again you know why you need to have a, a bit of a, a war mentality is because one when you start doing things like that and this is just it was just woodland originally with no permission to live there and the people who who went there were a lot of them for were from the twyford down road protest and they decided they made this conscious decision that they wanted to, to stop campaigning against the things they didn't like and to start fighting for something they did want 
And what they did want was uh, eco villages. And that's why that, um, uh, well, I don't know if they would call it an eco village. It certainly looks like that if you visit it. Uh, was set up so they've got you know they've got uh, gardens they've got uh, they, where they're growing food and all sorts they've got mostly solar um, and wind power I think it's only solar and wind actually uh, and it's uh, you know it's a tremendous place and you know so they, they, a lot of their um, income comes from uh, timber because there's a lot of um, Douglas fir on there so you know you've got to think these things through they've also got um, They've also got uh, plenty of fresh spring water on there uh, as well. The Tinker's Bubble actually was the, the well where the gypsies used to come. Uh, we, well, mentioning gypsies, you can't not talk about Pretty Patel's bill. There's an attempt right now to criminalise travellers, gypsies, uh, which is just the most appalling thing. I mean, you know, these people have been living as itinerants for thousands tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of years. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, so they're trying to make them criminals. So basically what's happening is you will have to pay to, to be alive. You know, if you want somewhere to live, you must pay money. And so one of the things I'm quite clear about is this land is there for everybody for free. It's a free gift and nobody should pay, pay a penny for it. A lot of people talk about land tax, don't they? <laughs> land value tax well this is just a way of making people make money out of their land who's to say that that's going to go to a good cause that tax it maybe goes to troops you know threatening russia or nato or something you know god knows but you know th to me the idea of taxing land is just completely potty you know there, anyway there's a lot of people argue for that the henry george foundation etc but uh, we had a talk by the Henry George Foundation when we went to Wisley Airfield just before we went to, that was 95. And the guy started talking from the Henry George Foundation. Within five minutes, there was no one left listening to him. They'd all just walked off, found him very boring. Uh, but anyway, uh, so so that's Tinker's Bubble, uh, bought, I think, around about the same time in 95 for 50 grand, 40 acres, mostly woodland. And uh, obviously, you've got to do this thing in, in collaboration with others. Uh, the Another example, which is a little bit more sort of, well, I suppose comfortable, you know, comfortable living. A couple of examples are, are co-housing. Uh, so here in Stroud, we have something called Spring Hill Co-Housing, uh, which is a fantastic project. David Michael uh, was spearheaded it, who's an architect. Uh, and he just was very determined. He knew, he got to know all the people that would make the decision pretty much before they made it. So he got to know them all socially, the various planning people, people in, in London, as well as the people in the uh, Gloucestershire Council, Stroud District Council, all the others. And so he had sized them all up, you know, and then he went for, he got a, a really nice design for this piece of land. They bought it and they didn't buy it um, on an option as far as I know they bought the land with the intention of building this uh, and it was quite cheap it was yeah it was a it was a big slope so it was a question of can we build on a slope and the answer was yes we can uh, in fact we can you know I think they're something like three stories high their co-housing is and they've got a lovely building there where everyone meets uh, quite regularly I'm not sure how often it is these days but they used to have weekly and or twice three times weekly meals together uh, which everyone was invited to um, and obviously the well one of the shocking things about that was that once it was built and people had bought their own flats there well they're not they're really nice flats they're fantastic I mean like three bedrooms they're enormous rooms David's quite you know he's a bit of an idealist as an architect he wants places to be really nice and uh, and they were finding that uh, they had already literally as they moved in their house uh, their home on the open market had doubled its value so you know they're paying something like 150 200,000 pounds for a flat which is then suddenly worth 400,000 if they wanted to sell it so you know this to me it makes se financial sense you know <laughs> uh so that's that's spring hill uh that's been going for something like gosh must be nearly 20 years now uh maybe 15 uh but it's just a really successful co-housing project another one is up in lancaster 
Um, again, all these groups started with uh, one or two or three really determined, dedicated people uh, who then brought around them, gathered around them a whole group. Now, you have to be very, very careful, and I'll tell you why, because uh, um, the, the Lancaster one, um, once they had uh, actually bought the land for their project, because they managed to, you know, sort of get the finance together for it, and it was a, you know, pretty rough piece of land, you know, and it was, you know, there was a lot of the time they, you know, there people are you're making money because you, you're you're getting planning permission to build on somewhere that hadn't previously been built on, and that uh, at least the value you're making, they realised that after about a year of going down the road of actually designing the place, now that is to say, deciding who's going to live where, etc and how many places can be built, what's the layout going to be, et cetera, what's the local authorities going to... I mean, he was a councillor, by the way, the guy that did it on uh, on Lancaster Council, which helps. So, you know, he doesn't have to chat to them to persuade them. He's already on there. And so, you know, it, so is they found that there were people who joined their group who were being very troublesome. Now... They may have been idealistic in their own ways, but the initial two or three people made a very, very sensible decision uh, to uh, put a policy lock. They passed a policy lock um, motion through their group so that the initial, uh, the initial plan and the initial objectives of their co-housing project at Lancaster could not be changed, right? So, <laughs> so these people after about six months of banging their head against a brick wall, left. And having spoken to the people at Lancaster, I got to know them quite well. They are absolutely convinced that if they hadn't done that, then the, the project, whole project would have been scuppered. And they're not sure whether these people arrived deliberately to scupper their project or whether they were just egotistical and you know, as some people in co-housing groups can be, of course, you know, if you want to do things differently, you're bound maybe to be a little bit egotistical. Who knows? But uh, they they certainly believed that they had come there to really sink the project. And they didn't succeed because the people had not been so naive who set the thing up in the first place. And if anyone wants to visit Lancaster, it's just a gorgeous place. Absolutely fantastic. Right next to a lovely river stream. Uh, so. Uh, again, nice communal facilities, a big hall where people, last time I stayed there was, I think, three nights a week. They have one at the weekend and two during the week, big communal meals. But of course, the main thing is that the rents are affordable because basically in co-housing, you are the landlord. You are in control of, for example, uh, service charges, right? So you're sitting on the group that decides on service charges. I mean, anyone that's, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm, I live in a housing uh, association place myself, but we get basically massive increases in our service charges all the time from the landlord, uh, which are totally unjustified. Uh, and we just simply have to suck it up, you know? So. To, to be your own landlord, that's really what this is about, isn't it? And it's about making sure that someone is not using your basic need for you and your family uh, to have somewhere to live for your kids to grow up in safety and security is not fleecing you. Uh, because if they're fleecing you, then how can you be happy in that place? And also, if you're helping run your own community, your own place, you've got security of tenure, then you look after it. You know, uh, if you if you're renting, what incentive is there for you to look after something for, you know, a, a rotten landlord, as many of them are, not all of them, many of them are. And they're just there to get as much money out of you as possible. And if you want to do repairs, you have to just stop paying the rent and they'll maybe they'll think about coming and repairing the place, you know, but they're only interested in the money. They're not interested in anything else. It's like a religion. And that's, I'm afraid where we're at with land uh, the religion of money is just uh, shutting it off from millions and millions of people in britain who need it and uh, you know i've got to have it i'll just as a just to finish because it'd be nice to allow people to have you know a lot of questions and things i'd just like to say a bit about our last 
uh, action that we did uh, last year, I mentioned briefly, with, which Linda was uh, came along to. Uh, and it's just amazing. The, you know, when you do a little thing like we did, the people that come and say hello are just fantastic. You know, we, we met so many people from the, from the local area who came and had a chat, you know, uh, we, we set up a yurt in a car park which is a disputed piece of land on the commons at Brancaster in North Norfolk and you know I would love for the Land is Ours campaign again you know to become a bit of a focus for this sort of activity around the country and to have more people coming on these little excursions I mean we've had tiny tiny events um but we've also had some quite big ones like I was telling you about with you know 300 400 people uh, at St George's Hill it doesn't just have to be a historical focus, and this one wasn't. It was a focus of uh, common rights holders, commoners, who were granted the land uh, in the 1700s under the uh, enclosure of that area. And this is all salt marsh, or almost all salt marsh, but it's a lot of it is above sea level and perfectly walkable, although some of it we sunk into in the mud. You know, we went out on excursion on the Sunday and came back rather, uh, you know, with a red faces uh, and very, very muddy uh, trousers <laughs> and legs and whatever. But, but what we achieved there, I think, was to just resurrect the whole issue of common rights holders. There are lots around the country. And I'll tell you, the big problem at the moment for commoners, that is to say, people who've got the rights to graze animals, whether it's horses, uh, cattle, sheep, on commons around the country are being attacked by, guess who? By the rewilding people. I was just finding out just a few days, a uh, couple of weeks ago, that uh, up in Cumbria, a guy has been, <clears throat> has been, whose family have been uh, grazing horses on the commons up in Cumbria um, for hundreds of years. He has just been made bankrupt in a court case launched uh, by uh, the, uh, natural England, people associated with the rewilding project, they don't want this livestock up there. They What they want is they want it just to be left for wild animals. Now, you might think that's a good thing, but this has completely destroyed this bloke. Uh, and uh, we've also seen recently in Wales a big attempt to stop people grazing, uh, or this is um, mostly... Uh, tenant farmers who they don't own their own land but they do have the right to graze cattle on the uplands in in mid wales uh, an enormous protest by the welsh farmers saying look what is going on the these uh, uh, these rewilders are kicking us off our traditional places where we used to earn a living again you know this is wrong this is just totally wrong uh, the idea that you can somehow make things better by taking away people's livelihoods when they have nowhere to go necessarily at all these traditional ways of life uh, is is totally wrong the same thing exact same thing has been happening in dartmoor too so you know i'm pretty shocked and i was also very very annoyed to see where we were in doing this action and i'll finish here okay when we were doing this action over in um in norfolk last summer that natural england along with the local wildlife trust had been lobbying to stop public access to the commons all along the north norfolk coast foot footpath uh, now this was driving the locals nuts in fact you know these quite a lot of them were quite wealthy you know saying well look i moved here because uh, this is a beautiful place to live and i'm not going to be told you can't walk on the commons who the hell do you think you are uh, in fact he's saying i and my grandchildren and my grandchildren's grandchildren if they want will walk here any time they like uh, so there's a big attempt at the moment i think under cover of this rewilding project uh, to exclude people further from uh, from land and anything to do with stopping people walking on land, uh, you know, uh, cutting off footpaths, cutting off access to uh, commons, access to public land of all sorts, uh, is uh, is totally out of order. Um, yeah, so you, as a journalist, you you will find me on. Uh, well, let's think. I do. I did have a radio show in Bristol every week, a politics program. 
uh, which was I was booted off the airwaves uh, uh, at the time of COVID because I was seen to be a danger um, because we were critiquing it. In fact, the very, very first uh, programme we did in February 2020, we were looking at the evidence that uh, the COVID-19, I think it was called SARS-CoV-2, uh, had been a uh, genetically engineered bioweapon. I mean, I'm not saying it was even now, but you know, we were raising this. This was a, a study which was circulated by Z the Zero Hedge uh, site, and it certainly looked legitimate to me. So we were discussing that straight away. Anyway, within a couple of weeks, we were booted off the airwaves permanently. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of censorship out there. Uh, I've been booted off better and bigger networks than uh, uh, than Bristol Community FM, uh, like, uh, for example, out of the BBC when I was working in, uh, in um, Salisbury and looking into child sexual abuse in Salisbury. And I've since found out that uh, Edward Heath was living there. Uh, I mean, I knew he was living there at the time, but I never made the connection that, you know, there was quite potential that uh, Ted Heath was involved in all this. Uh, but anyway, it would certainly explain why I was so uh, quickly booted out of the BBC when we started looking into this. Um, and anyway, so, yeah, I think I'll finish it there. And the, it's, the website is tlio.org.uk, tlio.org. Dot uk and that's the uh, land rights site but i also do uh, a sort of current affairs journalism site uh, and a four hour weekly podcast now every week uh, which uh, goes out on various other small networks live uh, and that is on mm -hmm. five o'clock till nine o'clock every friday evening we're live uh, and the website for that is thisweek.org.uk that's one word thisweek.org UK. So I'm afraid I'm sort of confined mm. to the internet mm. now, uh, pretty much. Although, no, I, hang on, no, not quite. I do do re fairly regular reports for uh, Press TV, which is an Iranian state broadcaster, um, and who they, they did actually fly me over to Tehran a few years ago, which means I'm not allowed to go to Israel now. And actually, the Americans have shut me out too. So there you go. So that's, uh, that's me, and that's uh, a message. It'd be lovely to have some questions. Oh, thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, and, and, you, and, and for coming when you said you are a bit under the weather and you still managed to do loads, that's really great. Um, I was wondering if anybody has got some questions they'd like to ask. Hi. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I take my video. There we go. Hi, Tony. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, there's loads in that that I was like, oh my God. And um, yeah, lots of things I could ask, but just sort of starting from the last things you said, because um, I live near Dartmoor, I'm, I live within the Dartmoor National Park. What what have you heard about what's happening on Dartmoor and rewilding and them um, getting apathy about people? I'd be interested. Well, I mean, okay, so uh, this is, there are various reports online about it. I think there is some sort of uh, Dartmoor, um, I'm trying to remember the details now, I was reading it. OK, so what happened in Dartmoor was Natural England wrote to a whole load of uh, people who were grazing. And they said to them, we don't want you grazing in the winter anymore. And of course, this is an enormous you know, blow to these farmers. And that this is on the moorland, basically. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they then got together and started making a fuss about this at a national level in Westminster, et cetera, and amongst their MPs. And then Natural England denied it. They said, oh, no, no, we didn't write to them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are you talking about? Anyway, it turned out that Natural England were trying to pretend that, in fact, they, they, they then scanned one of these letters that they got through the post and put it up on the internet and said, look, this is Natural England, it's your headed paper. You've even signed it, you know. Yeah. And so they said, oh, but it was a private letter. It says there it's not for publication, you know. But anyway, so they were using some pretty sneaky underhand tactics to uh, to really, I mean, imagine if you're a livestock farmer. I mean, yeah, you know, it's just not. It, it, it's, it's totally devastating to be told, no, you just cannot, you cannot put any sheep up, up there. Now, I mean, but, I'm not, they, I'm they not, don't surely have any jurisdiction who I don't actually know who the natural England people are. Do they have any jurisdiction? Because Dartmoor National Park are quite, you know, they've got their own. You know, 
I don't know, they're a law I'm unto honestly, themselves. I honestly so. don't know. But uh, Natural England have obviously got some policies that they're trying to bring in. Mm. And, uh, you know, anyway, they fought back against this. So the thing is, the farmers are a pretty, pretty tough lobby. A lot of this has been reported in places like Farmers Weekly and hardly anywhere else. But if you if you look for that, you'll find it. I, I can't remember the I'll, name I'll of investigate the, public, more the publication and... oh, which yeah. represents farmers on Dartmoor. It's pretty, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like Dartmoor week no no i don't know what it is but i can't yeah, well, i can ask some people but, but it was, yeah. you know i was i was pretty shocked to see that them backtracking like this you know of mm. course if you think it's a policy you want to implement you've got to have the courage to stand up and defend it but no they didn't want to do that they just said oh, no 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 we didn't say that but they did yeah it doesn't make sense does it the other thing if i may just I'll say briefly give time to other people um you were talking about the hedge funds and people you know with these conglomerates buying up you know for carbon um offset i mean that's horrifying and actually somebody it makes sense now because somebody who used to live down this way south devon who now lives in wales i met her briefly in a shop and she said oh yeah it's amazing because she lives in some valley in wales now she said oh it's amazing how many people buying land in wales have got offshore accounts and now i'm thinking oh that's that's what all that's about that is just shocking i mean it's absolutely crazy well, there's there's no proper, you know, national scrutiny of this at all by any of the national papers. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, hang on, as a journalist, I'm pretty disgusted to see most journalists, I think most people with half a brain cell are the state of journalism today. But this should be a discussion, it should be a national debate about this massive transfer of land. Who is it, by the way, who's buying up loads of farmland around the world? Oh, Bill Gates, wow. our friend yeah. Bill Gates. You know, there is a definite move uh, to take more and more land away from individuals, private individuals, and to put it into corporate hands, you yeah. know. So yeah. this this means industrial agriculture. So you know, in, industrialization, the factory floorization of it all. And you know, we in Britain have got, I think, a very important role in all this because we've got to, you know, because of because we uh we we did this thing of enclosure before anyone else privatizing I mean, if you go to france or ireland it's a completely different story mm. ireland by the way turned the whole thing around in the 1880s uh because they had a horrific rack renting landlord system in ireland where the the factors that's the you know the estate managers for the absentee landowners in right. ireland the british the english mainly uh they were squeezing rent out of these poor farmers and due to the balance of power at Westminster, the Irish had MPs in those days, and they managed to do a bargain, a deal, where they got government loans for the Irish, poor Irish peasants, to buy their own properties they were peasants on, and to build a house on it. And after they got that loan, the repayments on the loan were far less than the old rents had been, you know. Oh, so yeah. that's why you've got this amazing situation. If you ever go to Ireland, you find there's all these lovely sort of farmer types who've got the time to spend the day with you sort of lean against a, 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 a hedge or a, a gate and have a good old chat with you because they're not rushed off their feet desperate to make a living because they own their own property now after the 1880s there's a, there's a and the same is true in france lots and lots of small owner occupiers we in england and britain generally have been absolutely maniacal on taking this land off people mm, yeah it's shocking yeah it's anyway thank you thank you very much Hey, Linda, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, on the community right to build that the UK government told us we had on exemption and exception sites, if you had proven need for eco village type communities, what happened to the exemption and the exception sites? Have they also gone? to the highest bidders now and, and is the, are the government's just in denial that there is this need and this demand to get out of un anti social social housing and build our own communities for safe places for people to live in. I don't think they ever intended to do that, Linda. Uh, I mean, what they do, I think, is they they come along with some sort of uh, great sounding scheme that they hope that virtually nobody will uh, be have get their act together to do now 
in order to do these things, like I said, you've really got to get together a whole team of people who are experts in the various areas to do with construction, to do with planning, uh, you know, and to do with public relations, uh, to do with, you know, lobbying. Uh, whining and dining the people that you need to convince in order to get one of these schemes off the ground you know and that's what they did at Spring Hill and in Lancaster you know so in order to do something like that you really do have to be you know have to get a pretty good team behind you but certainly they're never going to just give you the land no chance. No they put 24 million out didn't they in 2013 I went to the getting um, getting it built event, which was co-housing, etc., Ely Cathedral in 2013. But the local authority had 2.4 million of that, and that's gone to precious little schemes. So it hasn't gone where it was supposed to go anyway. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot. We had a Bristol co-housing group as well, but they were very peculiar. They, I don't know what had happened to them, but their meetings were incredibly tedious, and uh, they seemed to have completely lacked direction. And they were they were fighting over minutiae, you know. So maybe they had been infiltrated. I don't know. Maybe it's just some of these groups. I mean, I think you know you've got to have a good dis good understanding of group dynamics as well, in order to see whether you know a group is going to function or not, and it's going to be able to do it. But you do have to, I think, to have that basic vision this is what we want and we're prepared to build the expertise you know it's force multiplication that's what they call it you know if it's just one or two people it's not going to work you need to have a whole bunch who are all behind it and they you know so then what happens is if one person uh, is knocked back then someone else turns up and lobbies the same person and if they're knocked back someone else turns up until they find somebody that they that, you know that they'll listen to uh, you know there's all sorts of reasons why uh, the people that you're lobbying the planning people etc obviously you, you know this is a the planning is a hell of a you know uh, obstacle cause but it's not impossible there are people out there who, who do this for a living and who, well, who, I do. That's, but i do i mean the, the planners weren't the problem the problem was the land and even if you've got the people and even if you've got the proven need and you tick all the boxes a hundred times over if there's no land you can't actually build it in the air that's well, the you build, yeah, well, there is land. There's plenty of land, and uh, yeah, there's loads of land out there. A lot of it is just be, you know, is is either unused, derelict. The thing is, it's mostly uh, cheap if it's not being built on. If it's brownfield, it'd be more expensive. Uh, but the trick is to find a nice piece. At the moment, uh, the the planning rules. I've no idea what the situation is in 2022, really, because things have changed so much. There's people getting planning permission to build on greenfield sites all over the country now, and including around London. You know the old greenbelt sites. So the land is there, Linda. You know you can see it as well as I can. It's just it's expensive. If it if the planning if the planning is going to be easy, it's expensive land. If the planning is going to be hard, it's cheap. Uh, but there's definitely land out there, and you know you can't expect you, what what you have to do in order to get tick the boxes with these government schemes is to get your group together and come up with some uh, you know buy a piece of land and just tell them right this is it we're doing it here. It's the buying that's the problem. So those that form the communities want to live in communities. A uh, lot have proven needs, self-employed, no regular income. You can't afford regular rents, regular mortgages or regular anything else. Is. So you form a community and you tick all the boxes and you've got the planners twinkle in the eye. They love the idea. But yeah. what you can't do, the exemption and the exception sites haven't been set aside. And if you can't get a bank account, you can't get any grant funds. You can't you can't you can't get the land with money because that money was supposed to have been set aside and was set aside by the government based on the back of all the exemplars of sustainable design that have already set important planning precedent. Yeah, but you're talking about money, really. love. You're talking about money, really. And if you've got a, 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 co a cohesive group of 30 or 50 people, you will have money. But some of those yeah. people will have the money. And even if they have to, you know, sort of lend it or whatever, they, they, we can juggle things and, you know, you will buy the land. So I think, you know, just saying that money is the reason why you can't buy the land, you just need to, you know, have a, a bigger group. And that's what they did in, you know, in, uh, in Stroud and in Lancaster. Yeah.
Well, maybe if we maybe if we can have these more regularly, maybe like more bigger groups will come with more variety. Who know, who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah, okay. Well, you can ask. Can I just jump in, Tony? You mentioned um, Bristol because I used to live up in Bristol, and the yard, which was a self build project in Bristol. They, I mean, they did really well and they had meetings for years. I did go yeah. to some of their meetings. Sorry, that's, yeah, you're right. That's a very successful, it was very successful. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've got another, they've got another because I've, I've been rummaging around <laughs> looking at stuff for all this year so far. And they've got another, and I think the yard lot are helping them, Bridge Farm self-build. Um, it's a new project down that way. I think it's sort of, nearby yeah. the yard I mean, these so. are self-built you're right but i mean of course yeah. that's another thing but uh i mean i just think co-housing is is really the you know more of a uh you know sound objective so you can bring a lot more people in on a yeah. project than you can on a self-build because most people don't actually want to build their own house yeah. themselves yeah. I mean, obviously, a lot of self-build is bringing contractors in to do this and that. But, you know, if, you, if you've if you got a uh, professional builders building you a co-housing project, then you put your money in. And I mean, for example, with Spring Hill, you know, you put your 150 yeah, grand. Yeah, I visited there. Yeah, yeah you put your years ago. grand in. Uh, you, two years later, you move into your place and you're sitting there on a nest egg of something like half a million, you know. There's one so, for sale now. It's about 700,000. You need a hell of a lot of money to live at Spring Hill. <laughs> well, yeah, but you didn't need that sort of money to build it. This is what you need mm. to have the confidence, you know, to, to do that. Now, I mean, you know, this is what I said at the start about direct action is you, I think you've just got to have a steely approach to it, right? I'm doing this, you know, and whatever comes in my way, I mean, we're going to sweep it aside with a smile, you know, that sort of approach. And also, you've got to be good at getting on with people and un understanding their differences and their needs, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, to form these newer groups, uh, you know, so something. But you're right. Yeah, the, the, uh, the self build group in Bristol was really successful. I think it was an old scaffolding factory or firm that uh, yeah, sold hence the name the yard I mean it was just yeah an old yard yeah, all sorts of different places a bit higgledy piggledy but uh, yeah but it's not everyone's thing self-build um, sure. and, and the the, the co-housing group I mean gosh I don't know what I think that I eventually got a email off them I think about 10 years ago saying oh we have decided to disband and I thought well thank god I missed out 10 years of pointless meetings then you know oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that yeah. happens doesn't it I think you were saying Catherine well you know a lot of these places you can go years and years of meetings and then it all falls apart and everybody goes their separate ways you know it can yeah. be a hell still, of a still learning we had we did have actually before before we kind of went our ways and some people have got land now it was Buying the land was the main was the main hurdle. Really, there was us versus developers, you know, and the developers won in, get, in getting the, in getting the land. But it's all learning, and and there's you know, yeah, there's learning. And some some of us have managed to find little, little bits now, even if even if it's not together. It's like little bits which are still living on the land. Well, let me say something else as well because I think uh, particularly for owner occupiers, farmers that are selling land for whatever reason, um, they they are quite picky about who they sell it to you know so they will take a drop in price uh you know they're not just looking for not necessarily just look especially if they're elderly you know they're not just looking for the dosh so don't assume that that you know that's the case so if that if your face fits a farmer may well send you sell you land uh far below its commercial value that's what they found at the Tinker's Bubble, is the land was probably worth at least, you know, two or three times as much. But the guy liked them, you know. He was just a bit of an old-fashioned bloke. And he said, oh, yeah, go for it. Go on, yeah, 50 grand, I'll, I'll sell you. So, if you know, it, it, it pays, I think. If you decide roughly where you want to live, go and get to know landowners around there, big landowners. Say, oh, look, you know, we're looking for somewhere with a spring and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they these a lot of these owner-occupier landowners whoever they are, farmers, big farmers, small farmers, even feudal lords or whatever, ladies, they are open to little things like this. Um, and, or they may be, anyway. So it's well worth getting to know them. And, and not to just assume you've got to go and look in the exchange and mart or whatever they have nowadays to, to buy a piece of land. Go and talk to people face to face. I've got to say, Wrexham Council were very, at the time, we were very supportive of us as well. We they kind of came to us as or we came to them as they were in need of affordable housing. And then here we are wanting to provide affordable housing. So 
it's, po it's possible. Yes. Yeah, so, well, who was that popping up saying a community land trust should have the first option to buy it back? Oh yeah, Martin, is it? Because you were saying about the Bristol Community Land Trust. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, that's that me saying that. Um, well, it, it wasn't really. It wasn't. I don't think it's related to Bristol Community Land Trust. But um, I guess thoughts I've had in the past is that if you have a community land trust or cooperative which has a development, that they should get the option to get the property back first of all. So it, and and buying it back at some similar price to what it's sold for, or a price related to local wages. And then if you have a network of these CLTs and cooperatives, you can people who live in them can move around them at that price and not have to chase the commercial market, essentially. That would be the ideal situation. To... Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. So so the, uh, the, the, the housing co-ops I was talking about, the co-housing places, are set up on a totally different financial model to that. So the idea is more people will buy into a project and put their money behind it if they know that they will benefit from any uh, increase in value. You know, so it's just common sense. If you're saying that, you know, you have a financial stake in this, you personally have that, um, then, uh, then people are going to be much more into it and they'd be prepared to put more money into it. Um, if they're told, well, this is going to be somewhere to live, but you know, you're not going to be able to, uh, it won't actually be, uh, you, you, you know, your investment in it, whatever it is, won't ha won't uh, grow. Uh, then people, less people are likely to invest in it. So I mean, it's just, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. I mean, yeah, community land trust. I was on actually on the community land trust board in Bristol when it first started, and I got booted off by this guy called Keith Cowling. On a completely, uh, I mean, he was basically a bully who was, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but he was, you know, he was, he was treating some of the board members, I think, I thought in the board meetings as chair in a really bad fashion. I had to say things like, well, look, hang on a minute. It's not her, uh, you know, decision. She's been to her board. She's asked them and they've said no so you, you know stop having a go at her because it's not her fault anyway i found myself booted off the board of it so that you know the community land trusts uh sound great but you know there's, there's some pretty you know there's I, I i personally didn't get on with the way that bristol community land trust was run and it's probably just as well because bristol city council were helping fund it at the time and they don't like me as a local journalist that's quite critical of the council uh, so it kind of was, you know, it was almost inevitable that something would happen for, I, I mean, it's been very successful since, you know, we, what we set up in the Bristol Community Land Trust has been brilliant. You know, it's all sorts of projects now come to fruition and got lots of happy people living in there for like a decade or so now. Yeah, I have to say, Martin, that's sort of my, you know, I was going towards the Community Land Trust. Um, I really, you know, I think it's very amenable to councils and local authorities. And what, what you described would be my dream. That is, you know, a set of cooperatives, Community Land Trusts around the country with that collection. And at the same time, you know, keeping the price, you know, I know it's maybe less wanting to invest because you're not going to get double, but to have the similar price to keep it perpetually affordable would be would be lovely. Yeah, would be lovely. So it's, um, it's going back to seeing housing as somewhere to live rather than an investment. Indeed. Well, the Community Land Trust acted as a blanket to ensure that the price values didn't go up. And this was what that whole thing was, because we first had council housing, which gold sold off. And then we've got the Housing Association housing, which is just like any corporate body. And this was to ensure that those of us who wanted to could build our own houses under our community right to build and our community right to bid or even our individual right to do so if we had proven need, i.e. that what we're living in is causing poverty, fuel poverty, child poverty, etc. It doesn't, the system is failing us and, and they keep cutting back on all of the benefits, etc. There's more proven need by more people now than there ever was before for this. And that ensured that you didn't sell off to make the profit. I mean, the co-housing groups have got a lovely way of doing things, apart from it's a standard profit on house. When people used to build, build villages like Great Ryborough, 29 High, the Station Road was originally, so the architectural historian said, the community hub. So they were had a hatch out onto the main road 
where hot food was served to everybody building the houses together as a community. And that was hundreds of years ago. And it's basically the same now, isn't it? We could be doing it in theory. I think Wales is getting closer, but um, yeah, I'm sort of, you know, there's, there's talk of it in the local council, there's talk of it, but I think there's still some way to go. They probably need assistance, <laughs> I think, with that. Oh, um, they say in all councils are signed up to UN Agenda 21, 20, 30 and Common Purpose. Their real values are not aligned with ours. Oh, I have to look into that. Well, maybe, yeah. And look, uh, I think the thing is, it, there is a reality of the property market out there. And people are quite recognised that they're putting a lot of investment into their homes, whether it's to buy it or build it or whatever, and uh, that they want that house to be theirs. I mean, same countries like Germany, this isn't the norm. Most people rent their properties. But it's perfectly legitimate to say that I want these bricks and mortar to be my personal property that I can then hand on to my kids, for example. We, we had many years ago, we had a... Uh, system of land tenure i mean this is we haven't even touched on this which is the idea of leasehold and freeholds yeah but is is the, it was the copy hold so the copy hold was in fact looking at the open field system um this was the system before enclosure uh what, you know what you see there is a completely different way of owning land and managing land it was understood in that system that everybody needed land and uh, so even those that didn't have anything, there was land set aside for them, uh, which was called the waste of the of the commons, you know, so there'd be a kind of, you know, where they could go and stick their caravan or they could build a little um, uh, shack or something. And and even the word dole, which many of us, you know, I don't know if it's used much nowadays, but certainly uh, in my 20s and 30s when I was on the dole, uh, I didn't realise this word actually was uh, came from a piece of land which was uh, I think it was I, I had to look right back in, in the Bodleian Library in Oxford when I was living in Oxford to a dictionary from something like 15 or 1600 or something ridiculous to see that the word dole originally meant a part or portion most commonly of a meadow where several persons have shares right so this idea that you know you're you're going to take a bit of money every week well no you, you're given land instead, and it's much more, it's going to be much more uh, sustainable to do that than to force you into the financial system. Uh, so, yeah, the, the open field system is really worth having a good look at. If people don't know it. It's just as a really good model for sharing land. And uh, it's basically, you know, much common land is worked on that system. So you had a. What did you a call that system, Tony? Can you repeat the, that? Yeah, yeah the, open, the open field system. And each village, and this, to, look, to be quite frank, this is the way that it naturally emerged from the days of yore, right? So we're talking about, you know, almost like the first people that stopped hunting and gathering and settled, decided that the land was best managed. Uh, and so that that is that open field system is involved a lord of the manor, who was the sort of boss of the uh, village he would be a minor feudal lord of some sort and he would above him have a couple of levels above him and would have a duke who would be probably ruler of the county who took their authority from the king so that's the way it used to work and you know you could you you could be ordered around a, bit, a little bit by the lord right because you had to go and do so much a year so many days work for him you had to turn up and go and work for the lord but you had security of tenure which is so crucially important you had this thing called a copy hold and that copy hold uh meant your home was you you could you know you, you could never be evicted and you could hand it down to your kids so that copy that's why it's copied to you know to the descendants and that copy hold went out i think in the early 1900s late 1800s but it's the traditional um, way of doing things uh, the, the land was generally managed on the um, these the open fields were generally managed on a road crop rotation system so you'd have something like three m massive fields uh, so much much less in the way of hedges in the countryside than we have today and, th and they would 
they would be rotated. So you'd have two every year, two of those fields would be growing and one of them would be fallow. That's in order to preserve the, uh, you know, the soil so that it doesn't, you know, you're not overdoing it. Uh, and everybody in the village would have, uh, basically it was like a massive allotment. So wherever you see these ridge and furrow, you know, if you go, go along uh, in the car, you look out the window, you can see these kind of lumps in the, in the fields. Those are the old ridges and furrows of the open fields. So it was on the ridges, not the furrows, because that was for drainage, that all the crops were grown uh, before enclosure. And so it's interesting, isn't it, how even in our fields today, you can see the remnants of the pre, basically pre-18th century, you know, pre-1700s, which was the big century of enclosure uh, system you can see evidence of it all around you the ridge and furrow um, most of those are just used for grazing now they were used for growing things like carrots potatoes and whatever um, and because it's grazing the you know the actual lie of the field I mean what was happening you know just to explain the enclosure was uh, that those uh, areas that had been being cultivated by local people were then turned over to sheep almost entirely because the sheep and the uh, mostly the wool was a major major uh, uh, you know economic force back in those days back in those days and um, not so much the meat but the you know the the the, the wool that these sheep produced every year um, and that it was much much cheaper wasn't it imagine if you can buy up the rights that all those people had to those open fields and just cover them with sheep well, suddenly you make loads of money, don't you? And this is what happened, apparently, is a lot of these enclosures were forced by big, powerful um, local merchants who are often big farmers too, uh, gambling in London and losing money and having to basically pay it back by uh, making more money out of their farms. And so they could get an act of enclosure through Parliament to kick all those people out of their cottages that they'd had for you know, countless generations um, and leave them sort of to, I think the compensation they got was like a barrel of beer or something like that, you know, for in exchange. So that enclosure system, the pre-enclosure system, there is one place in Britain you can see it in action still because it's still managed by, um, it's a village of Laxton in Nottinghamshire, which is near Newark. And uh, if you're up there in the summer, the locals are very friendly. The, the publican is, is uh, you know, will tell you all about the open field system because it's, I think it's part of the Crown Estate. They've preserved that one village. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the only one left in the country as a village which still runs the open field system. So, you know, someone somewhere has thought, well, this is worth preserving, even if it is just one little place. The other thing to say about all of this, is uh, and I hadn't even mentioned the Scottish crofters because they have also a very, very good model of land management. There was a, a massive battle back in 1888, I think, it's called the Battle of the Braes in Skye, where a whole load of people were going to be evicted through enclosure. I mean, what happened is, you know, the, the enclosures happened in England, but then we had the Highland Clearances in the 1800s much worse in many ways because people were so far that the, the cottages were so far from civilization that people could be burnt out of their homes you know some were burnt alive uh, in their homes because they were elderly they couldn't get out you know whatever so when these enclosure people came along they just burnt the cottage and they didn't know there was someone upstairs or didn't care there's a terrific book i think it's by john preble uh, called the highland clearances but but the, the, this all came to a head in 1888 and um, a whole bunch of um, police and bailiffs uh, got the ferry over to Sky and they were marching early in the morning over to evict these people. Anyway, on the way, um, out from behind rocks, jumped loads of people. The, the women of Sky had got together because the, the men apparently were a bit flaky and they said, oh, we've got to do what the laird says, you know. The women decided no. And they got hold of these rocks and they lobbed them at the police and they lobbed them at the uh, bailiffs and drove them off. And it just so happened that there was some guy there, I don't know if he'd been tipped off or what, uh, who was, uh, maybe he was even on holiday, I've no idea, but he was uh, wrote an article for the next day's Times newspaper. And 
And I, I suppose they get it the, in those days. I don't know, would it have been Telegraph or Train or whatever down to London? Uh, anyway, he he uh, wrote an article about all this, and it was it was called I can't remember the title of the article, but anyway, it had a massive effect. Everyone who was reading the Times said, "This is absolutely appalling. What the hell's going on here? You know, this is all happening out of sight, out of mind. A bit like the old triangular slave trade, isn't it? You know, so if it's not happening on your doorstep, you don't know it's going on. If the media don't tell you. Anyway, so this was in the Times, and uh, then there was a royal commission. They set up a royal commission into the grievances of the crofters. All the enclosures and the clearances stopped at the time, and they set up in law, they enshrined in law under the Crofting Act, the previous um, system. So the previous system had been a very similar, what I was saying about the open field system, which is that you pass your croft down through the family. One thing now, if you, if you, if you visit a proper crofting area, you'll find there's a whole load of houses, at the bottom of the valley, those people who live there can, cannot um, sell their house. You know, so in a way, it goes with what your my friend was saying just now about about uh, uh, housing co-ops, uh, or sorry, not housing co-ops, um, uh, co uh, help community me land trust. Community land trust, yeah. So you can't sell it, yeah. Anyway, so you can't sell your croft. All you can do is pass it down in the family, and you know what that means? There's, that means you cannot, it cannot be used as collateral uh, against a loan. A bank loan, which is how most people lose their homes, or well, many people over the years have lost their property, is through having a bank loan, and then they can't then pay back, and then they, they you know, the security, the bank takes the house. So, uh, and they also have, so they have a quite a big slice of land. So usually about sort of five, ten, fifteen acres of land attached to the house, which is their own personal to do what they want with, and uh, they also have grazing rights on the on the. Um, on the hills so that all in all means you've got basically a job for life you know you've got an income for life by whatever so even if you're not using your own piece of land you can rent it out so maybe if you're into it or something sitting in your croft you're making money in building websites you're not really that interested in in um, you know in in i don't know growing carrots or whatever you know so you can then just rent your place out for however many hundred pounds a year to someone else and they can use it to grow carrots but the main thing is you you know you're you also have this income of if you can be bothered to keep sheep you have the a massive area of land to put your sheep on and or even cattle so that as a model is a brilliant model and i think you know it'd be nice in in a way to sort of do a bit of a visit up there to see some of these people they're quite reclusive the scots yeah they don't really like to brag about things they're they're shall we say taciturn bunch but they've got a fantastic model in the crofting act of how land should be managed and organized uh, in order to to get rid of this whole idea that you can lose it and some giant corporation comes along buys it up or you know you're booted out and you have to sleep in a ditch <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then and Sammy asked the question, as living beings who have the right to live on this planet, why do we need permission given to build our own homes? There's many, many answers with that. <laughs> well, that's a good one, isn't it? Why don't we why don't we build a house? Come on. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things. It's, it's actually not a complicated, difficult thing to do. Just build it. I actually went when I was I think it was when I was in Dartmoor years ago, I stopped. Uh, to take a leak, jumped out the car, walked down the road, round a corner, and there was some sort of little, this was the last house ever built. Uh, um, it must have been some mad providence or something, but it was the last house ever built, apparently in Britain, that had been, because there was a law that if you could build the house and you could get smoke up the chimney before sunset, that you could uh, have it. It was yours. And what a great idea. You know, we could just have a bit of a laugh and do that, you know, get some publicity around it. Brilliant. Well, we, we, we have reached like a good, a good time. So, uh, yeah. so I think, I think whoever's shouting, you've got the timing right. <laughs> but thank, thank you so much, Tony.